Hello everyone, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece for this interview episode with Tad Crawford, author of On Wine Dark Seas. Tad Crawford is the author of A Floating Life, a novel, as well as The Secret Life of Money and a dozen other non-fiction books. His lectures have brought mythology alive at venues such as the New York Open Centre, Wainwright House and the Analytical Psychology Club of New York. The recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Award, Crawford is the founder and publisher of Allworth Press and lives in New York City. During our discussion today, our primary focus will be on Tad Crawford's most recent work of fiction, On Wine Dark Seas, a narrative that unfolds within the captivating era covered by the epic cycle. Notably, this cycle encompasses the renowned poems of the Iliad and the Odyssey. In On Wine Dark Seas, Tad Crawford offers his unique interpretation of the events and themes that transpire following Odysseus' return to his homeland of Ithaca. To provide you with a glimpse into the novel's essence, I will now read you the included description. Countless readers have thrilled to the adventures of Odysseus in the Iliad and the Odyssey, but what further adventures await him after his ten years of war and ten years of wandering? Narrated by Telemachus, to the bard Phemius, on wine dark seas speaks to the human drama of a man gone twenty years from home and family. A man who saw Troy on the night of its destruction, a man who lives the special quest, which is his destiny. In probing the inner journeys of a son and father separated by twenty years, who must come to terms with each other and their ruthless slaughter of the suitors of Penelope, it reveals the doubts and joys of Odysseus, Penelope, and Telemachus. As Telemachus tells Phemius, my father will be known to the future, not as the man he was, but as the man of whom you sing. Often at Troy, he called himself the father of Telemachus. So I too have a part to speak in his story. Wealthy men can pay some poets to chant a story first this way, then another. I cannot offer you wealth to hear me, but only the truth I know. The novel is a masterful recreating of the ancient mind, the landscape of Greece steeped in mythos and the gods, and the human dramas of characters made famous for all time by the Iliad and the Odyssey. In this interview, I have the pleasure of delving into the creative journey of Tad Crawford, the brilliant mind behind On Wine Dark Seas. We explore the genesis of his ideas and the themes that lie at the heart of this captivating work. Additionally, we dive into the intriguing world of mythology and how Tad skillfully weaves these timeless elements into his literary tapestry. Our conversation also ventures into the rich tapestry of the Iliad, the Odyssey, and other works of the epic cycle, as Tad seamlessly integrates their themes into this modern creation. I was personally captivated by how Tad's work seamlessly aligns itself with the esteemed canon of the epic literature. He presents his narrative in such a way that even those unfamiliar with the classics, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, can fully immerse themselves in this novel. For those well versed in these timeless tales, On Wine Dark Seas offers a familiar poetic rhythm that echoes these classics. Now let's embark on this illuminating interview with Tad Crawford, the gifted author behind On Wine Dark Seas. Uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome back to a, another interview episode on Casting Through Ancient Greece. And this time I'm joined by Tad Crawford, uh, author of On Wine Dark Seas. Uh, thank you for coming on, giving you some of your time to talk about your latest book, Tad. It's my pleasure, Mark. I'm delighted to be here. Before we do get started in looking at uh, your book, I thought perhaps you could give us a bit of a spiel on your background uh, so we can get to know you a little bit before we get started. Yes, uh, I have I have a bit of an unusual background because I trained as an attorney um, and practiced law and taught at the School of Visual Arts in New York City, uh, where I became very interested in protecting and helping artists with their legal issues. Uh, and I then wrote many, many uh, books to help creative people and eventually created my own publishing company, Allworth Press. But in the course of doing that, I also became very interested in Jungian psychology. And in particular, I had a, a dream that led on to my writing the novel on Wine Dark Seas. I've always been writing fiction, and this one was a, an unusual novel for me because it seemed to 
uh, come from the dream. And I understand you've got a bit of a background in the business world. Is that right? You've written a number of book, books in, in that area? Yes. So, so um, I, I wrote a book called The Money Mentor, which is about how to handle money. I wrote a book called The Secret Life of Money, which is a kind of Jungian view of money and going through the uh, mythology and symbolism uh, of money. Yep. And then I also wrote many practical books, as I said, for, for art professionals, including writers uh, and other disciplines of the arts, such as business and legal forms for fine artists or business and legal forms for photographers. And uh, there's a lot of, of practical business information in those, those titles. And I was at one point the general counsel to the Graphic Artists Guild, which represented artists and tried to increase the level of uh, artists' rights. Yep. And um, with your writing, I guess, in the business world and then fiction, did one of those come first or was it sort of a, a simultaneous <laughs> so, so the interest? In, the interest in fiction came first, but... Um, I must say that having writing as a skill was a wonderful thing for law school where a lot of writing is required. And, um, and then I, I continued fiction and also write nonfiction initially to try and, and help artists with their business problems. Okay. Uh, and, and that duality continued. Yep. And uh, I understand On Wine Dark Seas is your second work of fiction, that's right? The second published work of fiction, yes. Yep. yep. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm very happy to see it and to see it in the form that it's in. With the, I like the cover, I like the design of the book, and, uh, you know, just exciting to, to have it out in the world. Yeah, and as you said, it was, uh, you had like a dream that, help inspire the creation of this one was it yes yeah so um i was dreaming that my father was a greek youth and he was wounded in the ankle and i lifted him up to help him and carried him down into the underworld into a necropolis the city of the dead and as i carried him down he became lighter and lighter and older and older and when i got to the bottom there was a, a hermaphroditic figure that had uh, some liquid that he could drink and i'm not sure whether he drank it or not so it was very much a, a father-son dream uh and uh, about the relationship of the generations and of course the fact that the older generation passes. Um, but I became very interested in trying to understand what it meant to be a wounded Greek youth. And the image of Achilles naturally comes directly to mind, um, wounded, wounded in the ankle because his, his mother, uh, Thetis, didn't held him by the ankle as she, she dangled him over the fire to make him immortal. So he was vulnerable in that one place on his body, the Achilles tendon, and eventually killed by an arrow from uh, the bow of Paris. Um, but it, he was killed after the end uh, of the Iliad. So he was. <laughs> we know of this because of other poems from antiquity, not not the Iliad or Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, but in exp in exploring that that theme. Uh, it, it took me deeply. It seemed to me that a paradigm relationship of absent father and son was Odysseus. And Odysseus did not want to go to war, but he was one of the hundred suitors of Helen. And those suitors agreed that if Helen were ever uh, carried off, uh, they would come band together and go to bring her back. And this was to prevent any of them from even contemplating such an idea. So uh, it's interesting that when he returned home, finally, after 20 years of war and wandering, that there were 100 suitors in his hall, and he had to decide what to do about that. Mm. So 
Now, obviously, you said um, it's it came from a dream, but obviously, you've connected that dream to the Greek world as well. Have you? Yes. Had, did you have an interest in the Greek world um, history and myth uh, well before writing? I, I had certainly you know read the Iliad and the Odyssey, and I uh, had a familiarity with Jungian uh, interpretations of symbols and and gods and goddesses like Demeter and uh, Persephone, who are fertility goddesses. But I had not uh, delved into it at the depth that I, I then uh, entered after the dream in the course of trying to understand what what was this about in, in my psyche. And, um, and then what did my, and then there was a response. At times it seemed almost like I was channeling something. Uh, of, of what this story was, of what happened after Odysseus came home to be with the son he hadn't seen for 20 years, whom he had left as a tiny infant. Yeah. And in fact, the reason he went to Troy was that uh, he didn't want to go. He wasn't going to go. He was going to stay on Ithaca and break his vow uh, that he made with the other suitors. So he pretended to be crazy and it was plowing his fields with salt. And Agamemnon came and, and brought other princes with him. And one of them brought the baby Telemachus, Odysseus's son, and dropped it in front of the plow. So if Odysseus had truly been mad, he would have simply run the baby over. But he stopped the plow, saved his son. And by saving his son, he had to go to war. Uh, so that was 10 years of, of war at Troy. And then after the victory, the, the very, very slow process of trying to get home to Ithaca again, which took another 10 years. Yeah, and that's where we, I guess, come to the, the Odyssey and uh, exactly. all, all the adventures <laughs> yeah. contained within. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting how in Greek, I mean, it's in all myths you find a lot of those eternal um, archetypes and themes tend to exist in most well, mythologies and religions uh, for that matter as well, and how they are quite eternal no matter what culture you live in. Yeah, I, I thought that one of the interesting things about the fact that the Iliad and the Odyssey are, are carved out of a larger body of myth is that the, the body of myth begins with the gods. Mm. Uh, so, so, so Zeus, the chief god, and, and, and Themis, the, the sort of goddess of, or the spirit of uh, justice and order, decide that um, something should be done uh, in relation to the human, the human uh, situation. And they, um, they have strife go to the wedding of, of Thetis, uh, who is the mother of Achilles, and Peleus, and throw the the uh, golden apple of, of discord among the, the people, which includes the gods and goddesses. Uh, and it says to the fairest. And then uh, Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite dispute which of the goddesses is the fairest, and they are transported to Mount Ida, where Paris, who is the one of the sons of the king of Troy, uh, chooses Aphrodite as the fairest, and that is the beginning of the the, the end of Troy. Uh, so the the, the 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 gods and goddesses do seem to represent archetypal energies. I I don't fully understand why the why Zeus uh, wanted to see the downfall of Troy or why the gods and goddesses took differing sides in the war at Troy, uh, when presumably they, the, the, the outcome was foretold, uh, having come from Zeus. But nonetheless, uh, it, it makes for a, a, a story of tremendous drama. And on the lips of Odysseus, also a shifting story, uh, which depends on, on who the listener may be as to exactly what happened. Yeah. It's it's interesting um, from my reading and I guess what I gather, it appears the older stories and myth or ones that seem to be told in an older time 
seem to represent the gods as more as more as uh, personifications of certain things. So Poseidon wasn't, you know, the, you know, the man or the, you know, the, the god that we see as this uh, muscly figure in the ocean, but he was the ocean or he was the earthquake. He was the actual event that was taking place. And it right. is later on, man has then created the gods in their own image, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And right. And then, and then Poseidon has the same father son story because Odysseus puts out the eye, the eye of Polyphemus, mm -hmm. his gi giant one eyed son. Yeah. Um, but of course, Polyphemus was, was, was eating, uh, Odysseus's uh, ship members and intended to eat Odysseus as well. So Odysseus certainly had some reason to do that. Mm. Uh, and Poseidon's anger might be viewed as unfair. Yeah, there seems to be a shift in, I guess, trying to understand the natural world and connecting man's own world to, to the, I guess, the divine and the unknown. And that's probably why we get a lot of these stories. Right. And also, I... I so much of, of the story of Odysseus's return is on the his troubles are at sea. Mm. So he's in Poseidon, he, he, if you could call the ocean Poseidon, or you could say he's in Poseidon's domain. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's a it's a hard voyage home, which he only makes with divine intervention. Yeah, that's it. Um, all right, Tad. Well, I thought we could perhaps now turn to your actual work, um, where you weave in your narrative amongst all, all the Homeric epics. Um, so, could you perhaps, um, before we sort of delve a bit deeper, could you give us a bit of a summary and and what your book is trying to achieve? Yes, um, I see Odysseus as a paradigm of the absent father. When he returns after 20 years of, of absence to a child who was probably less than one year old when he left and has no memory of him, it's going to be a shocking coming together. And Odysseus is going to have to make a new life on the island of Ithaca, which he didn't want to leave, but left because he had to go to war. So there's a working out of the father son theme. And in my novel on Wine Dark Seas, the, the novel picks up with Telemachus saying that he wants the bard Phemius, whom he is speaking to, to recount Odysseus's story for future generations. So Telemachus is the narrator and begins with how, how as a child they waited for the ships to come back from Troy, but the ships never came and waited for his father, but his father never came. And then the suitors came, uh, and as in the Odyssey, Telemachus journeyed to the courts of Nestor and Menelaus to try and get news of his father. And it's upon his return from that journey that Odysseus actually does return to the island of Ithaca, and he immediately enlists Telemachus to kill the hundred suitors who have been not good guests, but uh, the, the, the young men whom Telemachus has spent his time with, and particularly one, Am Amphinomus, who is a, uh, a decent man. And Athena has a big role in all of this. She helps Odysseus get back to the island and she proceeds to smooth the way for him as they slay the hundred suitors of Penelope and then deal with the anger of the towns, townspeople, the relatives uh, of the slain suitors. And then Odysseus makes his journey to Thesprotia over the objections of Penelope to make his sacrifices that Tiresias told him he would have to make if he were to ever live at home in peace and have a gentle seaborn death. And when he returns, there is still trouble with the islanders 
who are unhappy now with his impiety uh, in cursing Poseidon at the time that he made the sacrifices on the mainland. So that's another uh, sort of area that has to be navigated by Odysseus. And in the course of this, he tells stories of his adventures. And as you know, in the Odyssey, since none of his men returned with him, whatever he says about what happened is all that we know. Mm. And we don't know if he's a trustworthy narrator or if he's making things up. He's quite capable of making things up because sometimes he says he's uh, the son of the Cretan king and that uh, he had really a different sequence of adventures than, in fact, he tells at other times. Which we, uh, and, and those are what we believe to be the truth. So um, including in, in the, these adventures are his speaking as the son of the Cretan king and saying that it was Penelope who was taken to mm. Troy and that he went to Troy as a Cretan to bring her back, but that their ships were mm. sunk basically by an encounter with the sirens and it's a whole different story. And in the end, as he ages, um, he and Telemachus try to know one another better, but it's a difficult thing to overcome not having been with a child for 20 years. And also his own nature, his own need to brood and think and uh, philosophize about what happened to him on his journeys and his relationship to the gods. And it ends then with the death of Odysseus. Yes. And um, one thing I found um, interesting too is um, I'd been, I've been listening to your book on um, Audible and you don't necessarily need to know the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey, I don't think, as I think you've done a very good job of having Odysseus retell a lot of those stories as well that then fits it into your narrative. Um, and I just found that quite interesting how a lot of, yeah, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey is told through your tale, but from that perspective of, of the uh, dynamic between Telemachus and uh, Odysseus. Yes, well, and, and what I did was to, I mean, there are a lot of things that we know about the story of the the Greek heroes who went to Troy and what happened there that are not in the Iliad or and that, that don't happen in mm. the Iliad or Odyssey and, and are only recounted to us if they're mentioned at all. So, for example, uh, the Iliad ends with the funeral games for Patroclus. We don't see the, the, the city fall. We, we don't see the, the, the burning of the city. Um, and we don't see the, the, the death of Croesa, Aeneas's wife. We don't see Aeneas' escape. We, we only know of those things as from other sources essentially the, the larger body of myth and the fact that in antiquity there were six other poems that attempted to complete the cycle of, of the epic cycle uh, as it's called and um part of the so part of what odysseus is talking about are things that are not really part of the iliad or the odyssey but are necessary if he for example is to complete the 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 Task put upon him by Tiresias, he has to make this journey to the mainland uh, after his return to, to it, the island of Ithaca. Um, and also he took part in many things, such as uh, the, the building of the, the Trojan horse or being within the Trojan horse to get inside the walls of Troy. Um, and he recounts many of these stories. So that, in a sense, the, the on wine dark seas uh, gives a fuller view of the of the larger myth than the Iliad or, or the Odyssey do. For example, the Amazons come to to aid the Trojans, 
And Achilles has a duel with Pentelicia, the queen of the Amazons, in which she's killed. And that's not recounted in either epic either. Hmm. So um, it just an, it's an opportunity for Odysseus, the storyteller, to speak of things he didn't speak of necessarily uh, in the Odyssey. Yeah. So obviously you've um, made use of this wider epic cycle and drawn what you can from that to then also insert this into the narrative as well. Yes, uh, absolutely. How um, and, sorry, I was just gonna say, how difficult was that to do? Given that I guess some of this stuff we only know through uh, passing accounts and and whatnot. So, um, because the, the other six poems exist only in fragments, yep, uh, or or later brief summaries, it it's hard to just make a. a it's, it's hard to use them as you can use the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, but they were certainly uh, inspirational and uh, stepping off places to fill in the story. For example, really, n n n we don't know how Cruisa, the, the wife of Aeneas, died on the night Tro Troy fell. We only know she died. We don't know, for example, uh, who killed uh, Aspinax, the son of Hector and Andromache? We know how he died, but we don't know if Odysseus or someone else killed him. So my book resolves some of these questions uh, with Odysseus often as the the person who was responsible for some of these horrors of war. Hmm. And I noticed you, you made mention how we don't really get much of an account of the actual uh, the, the Trojan horse in the, the whole epic cycle when it comes to, or in the Iliad, um, and in between the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, was that one area that you had considered perhaps even uh, writing about? Like what um, what was the reason for setting it after Odysseus' return? So I didn't really want to write about the fall of Troy uh, as the whole book mm -hmm. because... This was really a father-son story for me, yep. and and therefore I really wanted to tell of the relationship of Odysseus and Telemachus after Odysseus returned to his family on Ithaca, uh, and and in a related way also about his relationship to Penelope, um, and although a lot of uh, of what happened at Troy is woven into. Uh, the story is told by Odysseus. The primary story is um, what will happen between him and Telemachus. Yep. And that was a big decision, making Telemachus the protagonist rather than, say, um, his father or mother, Odysseus or Penelope? Well, um, <laughs> there are a number of books that uh, tell the, the tale from different points of view. Yep. And it seemed to me yep. that it had not been told from Telemachus's point of view, and that that he was in a way a, a a wounded child to to be not only deprived of a father, but uh, seven years after the end of the war, his father still hasn't come back, and the suitors start to gather, and uh, he just he's not having any kind of a normal life. Uh, it's a difficult position to be in, and I thought telling his story would be um, uh, challenging and interesting, and, and also that in the dream, my father was a wounded Greek youth, and Telemachus is certainly a wounded Greek youth, although the wound is uh, figurative and, and not literal. Yeah. Yeah, so it just makes sense to uh, use Telemachus. That way you can connect it to your dream as well as um, what you want to try and uh, project out of the, the other bits of the uh, epic cycle. Yes. Um, now, I know you, you just did, you did refer to it before, um, that there was a lost Greek epic poem, and that was known as the, uh, what was it, the Telegony? Uh, oh, Telegony. Telegony, sorry. Um, yes. That's connected to Odysseus. Um, could you tell us a bit about what this poem is meant to be about? And 
is your story a replacement for this tale? As I've read that you find um, the original to be an unlikely tale. So I, I, I do find the original to be an unlikely tale. And it was, there, there's some dispute about when were these eight poems written? And were the Iliad and Odyssey written first? Or were those other six poems written first? And then the Iliad and Odyssey. And also the, there's, that leads to the question of, uh, is, is Homer one person, two people, or maybe a whole group of people who were uh, bards who recited this poem and added to it a, 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 as they went along. In any case, um, the Telegony uh, posits that Odysseus had a son with Circe. Uh, his name is uh, Telegonus. And he comes to the island of Ithaca looking for his father. And then when he finds Odysseus, but doesn't know who he is, uh, they have a kind of, um, I guess, dispute. And uh, Telegonus wounds him with a spear tipped by the spine of a stingray. Uh And and it was believed in antiquity that such a spine would be fatal. And and Odysseus dies. Then... um, Telegonus marries Penelope, and Telemachus marries Circe. So there are several problems with this. Um, for, first, Tiresias predicted that Odysseus would have a gentle seaborne death, and there wouldn't be anything gentle about dying from being speared with with this, you know, the barb of a stingray. Um, but also the the marriages at the at the end of this story, um, uh, Telegonus would be um, probably about seventeen, and Penelope would be about fifty. Uh, it just doesn't really make any sense. And why would Telemachus want to marry Circe, who is a kind of predatory goddess, um, whom Odysseus was fortunate to finally get away from. Um, so it seems like if you look closely at the prophecy uh, of Tiresias, you would come to a different conclusion for the story of Odysseus. And that's what I've tried to follow. This isn't really a replacement story, uh, although it does cover the same time period. But it is a story based on on what Odysseus tells us of his journey to the underworld and his meeting with Tiresias. Yeah, so you've you've taken that element and tried to draw out in your narrative what seems to closely represent that. And I guess um, exactly. And um, I guess you could find too in uh, in myth and epic poetry, you often do have the same, I guess, tales told. They're not, I guess, designed to replace each other, but they're different takes on certain uh, events or, or things that happened during those times as well. Sure. So even as I, as I mentioned before, I mean, uh, no, no one knows who killed Carusa. Uh, no one knows exactly who killed Astyanax. Um, and, and there are even larger elements that, that we don't know. So when uh, Telemachus is in the court of Menelaus, and Menelaus relates the story of the Trojan horse. Um, it's sort of to put Helen down uh, more than to really go in depth into the into the the story of the Trojan horse. But that um, he still doesn't he doesn't view her as especially trustworthy because of what happened because she went to Troy with Paris. Yeah. And that's, um, I guess, what my next question was uh, leading to. Obviously, uh, Helen of Sparta, or as we know her, Helen of Troy, is famous for being the uh, face that sets out of a thousand Greek ships. Um, however, in your narrative, you have Odysseus tell stories in which um, Penelope uh, was taken to Troy rather than Helen. And what, what was the reasoning behind this? Yes. So I wanted to show that Basically, we rely 
on Odysseus telling us the truth. But the Odyssey shows quite clearly that he's as capable of weaving one story about an event as another. So we're relying on someone who's who's a very able storyteller and liar if he wants to be. Mm. And uh, if we if we do that, how do we know uh, what we can believe in and, and, and what we can't believe in? So in telling in having him make up this story of Penelope having been taken to Troy, uh, and again, he's the, the son of the Cretan king in this. He tells the story and he has to go on uh, to Troy with his ships but they immediately succumb to the temptation of the sirens. And, and he's the last one left alive, and he's strapped to, to the mast, and the ship breaks apart, and he's carried by the mast to an island uh, where he meets a woman, and he's basically, he thinks he's going to be left there. And then the story goes on, and he ends up going to Troy finally and seeing where Penelope is the queen. This is only one chapter of the book. It's not the whole book. Yep. But it, 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 in the course of this, uh, he he, view, he he views the battle between Achilles and Pentelicia, the queen of the Amazons. Um, and he sees Paris shoot the arrow that kills Achilles by hitting him in the heel. So it, it brings in elements of the story that we know that are not in the Odyssey or the Iliad, um, but it brings them in in the same uh, uh, way of by Odysseus's storytelling that we've learned so many other things that we believe to be true, but we don't really, we can't really be totally certain. Yeah, and it's given you the opportunity to really point out how how much can we trust um, everything that Odysseus does tell us. Um, exactly, and, and and what a wonderful storyteller he is. Yeah, yeah and and if it was, a, I guess, a historical event, we would be questioning these sorts of things. You know, he's been away for ten years, travelled back home for an, another ten years, and he's the sole survivor. Um, so, how much, you know, how much credibility does, does these stories have, given the the passage of time, as well as him being the only survivor? And then coupled with the fact that uh, he's well known for being quite a crafty figure as well. Yes, he's he's uh, crafty. Uh, he's wily. Uh, he's polytropos, which means he's many sided, and you may be on one side or a different side uh, as he tells his tales. Um, nonetheless, he does always seem to want to get home to Ithaca, and um, and and finally does do that. Um, it's just that he also wants to obey Tiresias, and no sooner is he with Penelope than he wants to leave and and go on to uh, make the sacrifices that he has to make. And and I should say that the reason it took him ten years to get home was because when the Greeks sacked Troy, they they violated the the temple of Athena and destroyed her statue. And Athena then, who had supported them throughout the whole war, Athena then abandoned them. And when she abandoned them, um, Odysseus's issues or problems with Poseidon, the father of Polyphemus, whom he had blinded, uh, then came to the, to the fore, and it became impossible for him to get home over the ocean mm. until Athena intervened again. Yeah, so it's it's almost like we can see that that play on um, the divine and um, how, how it's woven into the human life. We're looking for uh, ways to connect that to what will explain what's happening to you where Athena, I guess, represents that good fortune or um, the, the help that you're, you're getting along the way. But then uh, when that disappears, I guess you, then you look for ways to explain that, and that's through the absence of Athena. Right. I mean, he has a he has a right relationship to Athena, but that's lost to all the Greeks. Mm. And it's only when, at, at the beginning of the Odyssey, 
Zeus, uh, Athena pleads with Zeus to let Odysseus return home, but finally that's put in motion. Also, you, you know, I have thought that some of the the terrors that he encounters on the way home, it seems almost like post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, the, the, the sirens who sing and make men leap off their ships and drown, or Scylla and Charybdis, these terrible, the, the, the whirlpool or the monster uh, that, that devours men. They're, they're, they're the, the man-eaters. Uh, they steal the, the cattle of the sun god. I mean, all of these nightmarish things. And you think he had a terrible time at Troy. Uh, he, he saw and did things that are hard to reconcile. Mm. Uh, this man who wanted to stay home with his infant son, um, but was forced to go and and played a heroic role because not only did he uh, help in, in creating of the Trojan horse, but right at the beginning of, of the Iliad, he, he, he the men are fleeing to the boats and he turns them around. Yeah. Uh, he appeals to them not to run, but to fight. So he's a leader. Mm. And that point about the PTSD, it's uh, quite interesting. I've seen it. It's raised a number of times through different uh, things I've read. I actually had a uh, interesting discussion with a historian, um, Owen Rees, who I'm not sure if you may have heard of. No. No. Uh, so I did an interview with him. It was on a, a book that he did on Athenian homecoming and, and going to war. But um, a whole chapter is devoted to, uh, I guess, the view of PTSD in the ancient, in ancient times. So, um, yeah, I just thought that you may find that quite interesting if you, uh, had a, had a look at his work as well. That was only, I think he only came out with that, um, uh, end of last year. Oh, great. Um, and there was also a book called the wrath of Athena, hmm. which was basically a, a discussion of, of why was she enraged with the, with the Greeks? What, what had they violated? That made her uh, abandon them, and uh, you know, led to Agamemnon uh, being slaughtered by uh, the lover of, of Clytemnestra, and Menelaus lost all but five of his ships and ended up in Egypt for a number of years. And it was not an easy return for most of them. Yeah, and it's um, and that one point he did um, bring up in that was how I guess. We can nearly keep more of an open mind with PTSD, where perhaps the our values and ethics that we have today were not the same that the ancient Greeks had, and there were other elements at play that may have been more religious that caused certain elements of PTSD to develop as well. Right. Well, that that's that's a great thought. Um, mm -hmm. And one other thing, and just in relation to what happens in re to to the suitors, um, is that. At the time of, of, of the epic, uh, basically, there wasn't much in the way of public law. So if there was a wrong, it was sort of up to the family to avenge it. And um, there was no authority that Odysseus could appeal to to say, please ask the suitors to leave my premises. Um and he, without even seeming to think about it, took the took the law into his own hands. He he uh, was the law because there wasn't a law beyond the household except the law of the gods. Yeah. And when Athena came to his side, uh, then everything was sort of set up correctly for him. Yeah, and that's the thing we take for granted these days. We're I guess the the invention of of law, where it became the state's um, responsibility, um, was only, I guess, sort of starting to develop during the archaic period, especially in Athens. And um, right, so we're talking we're talking we, about it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, if we found someone in our in our home, we'd call the police. Hmm. <laughs> we we wouldn't get our bow and arrow out. Yeah, it was. Uh, like you said, it was the family's responsibility to um, find justice for wrongs against them. And um, I guess maybe in, in a smaller 
in tribal more tribal societies it 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 works but when societies start becoming larger that's where you start seeing a lot of those blood feuds get out of hand as well right well one, one thing i've thought about is um odysseus was one of the suitors of helen mm-hmm. and um because of that he had to go to war and in a sense because he couldn't get back from the war there were a hundred suitors in his hall when he did get back so um it seemed to me that an important part of his journey was the encounter with polyphemus when he says polyphemus says what's your name and he says my name is nobody and then after he's blinded Polyphemus and they escape from the, the cave under the bellies of, 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 of rams and, and sheep, um, the, the other uh, giants say to Polyphemus, what's wrong? And he says, you know, n- n- or, or who, who harmed you? And uh, Polyphemus says, nobody. But I, I think it has another meaning, too which is at some point on that journey, he has to abandon his his ego. Uh, he has to let go of it because it's just not working the way he's been acting in the world. And he's had so many, um, so many misadventures in a sense uh, that all of the different aspects of ego, which might be symbolized by his crew, are stripped away. And he's just left kind of alone and has to become nobody if he's ever going to get home. Um, and this is, this is a change from the, from being the hero. Mm. It's, it's a different view. And it corresponds then to his wish that he hadn't been one of the hundred suitors of, of Helen and had been able not to go to war. Um, so I think that, there, that there's a lot of mm, psychology. It's a wonderful story uh, about the the issues a man has to face and and how he changes because of them. So we, uh, yeah, in essence, you're kind of seeing a figurative sort of uh, rebirth in in him, I guess, becoming anonymous, and then then the story develops behind Odysseus afterwards. Yeah, could could I read a just a brief passage from the yeah. book about that? Go okay for it. Uh, yeah. So this is um, Odysseus uh, speaking to Telemachus, and he says, um, "I have returned here as nobody, a truer name for me than Odysseus. When nobody knocks on your door, Zeus himself promises hospitality." So nobody will make a list of the maidservants who have whored with the suitors, and the suitors will remember nobody when they reach the gloomy kingdom where Achilles rules. In that world, a man would willingly take a thousand blows to feel the sun's warmth for a fleeting instant, and you, if you are true to me, shall be nobody's son. So it's this idea that the presumptions that we've lived by without examining them have to be looked at again yeah and if they haven't if if there have been reversals in your life it's time to consider something different something new and change yep reevaluate what's taken place yes and um you reading that was uh, perfect for my uh, next question I had too. <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to say, obviously, when when we read the Iliad and the Odyssey, it's very different than reading a, a work of prose or or history. It's mm. like, it's an epic poem basically, and there are conventions it's written by. Um, now I found I have been listening to your book, and you get a similar feel um, with how you've presented uh, on Wine Dark Seas. Um, is this are you a lover of poetry as well, or did you look to incorporate into your narrative style um 
the nature of the source materials that you were drawing from? So I, I, I certainly enjoy poetry, but I, I felt what happened here is as I got deeper and deeper into the materials um, ab around the Iliad and Odyssey and, and uh, about the Iliad and Odyssey, that, that it was almost as if there was some voice speaking in me that, that just came out. So at certain points in the writing, I, I would uh, imagine um, uh, maybe a couple of hundred words that I had never really thought about before, and they would simply be there. So I would say that there's a channeled aspect to the book that came from being so deeply immersed in the material. And if I could just give a, a, a quick example of that, um, there, there's this in the book 24 of the Odyssey, uh, Laertes um, impales the father of one of the suitors with it with his um, spear. Uh, but before that, I imagine an exchange between them that's not not in the Odyssey. So uh, the father of the suitor curses Laertes, who's the father of Odysseus, and says, "Goat griever." Isn't it enough that your son took a generation of men to die at Troy? And Laertes responds in kind, Upethes, pirate and slaver, you saved your son from Troy, while mine had ten years of war and ten years of wandering. And it then continues. So um, those words were just there. Mm. I didn't. I didn't kind of compose them and then rewrite them and then think about them and then come back and write them which again which is more my normal style of of composition yep uh, and uh, the 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 phrase goat griever used as an epithet uh toward laertes the, the father of odysseus it, it wasn't until after i had written that that I read something that explained why goat griever would be a term of uh, opprobrium, which is basically that, that the goat is not um, is not favored by Athena, and and there and and actually the the, the Gorgonian the 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 the, the, f the face on the breastplate of Athena uh, is from the the goat, yeah. but I didn't know that. Yeah, so nice. it's sort of interesting that you can you can bring into to something you're writing things that you don't consciously know at that time. Yeah, well, I think it's it's done very well. Um, it's not only are you drawing from the epic cycle, the themes that exist within much of that cycle as well, but then you keep the continuity with the style that you've written as well. So it, it makes it feel uh, a part of the the wider story, so to speak. Yeah, it, it certainly is. It, it places itself in that larger epic cycle mm. uh, and draws from different parts of it, as did the later, you know, Greek uh, tragedians, um, such as Euripides with the Trojan women. Yeah. Which, again, we don't know that there are that the Trojan women are taken into slavery by reading the Iliad because it ends before the fall of Troy. Yeah. And it just shows you how. I guess many different writers can take elements around um, the cycle and uh, I guess weave it into certain stories themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting. I liked it. And um, well, I guess this kind of brings us to the end of our chat today, but um, I had one last question for you. Sure. Um, have you got um, any future projects that you're currently working on? Um, perhaps any more uh, works of fiction? So I, I've actually just finished another novel, and um, I would hope that it would be published sometime maybe in 2024. Yep. And it's called uh, The Cave of Forever, and it's a novel about grief. Um, so I, um, I explore the topic, and um, it was a difficult book to write, but... Um, uh, I think for me, a helpful book, mm -hmm. um, and, and all of these things grow out of personal experience and personal needs. Um, 
So I was happy to kind of be able to go all the way through it and finish it. And I, I've just been revising it based on some readers' feedback uh, and uh, kind of tightening it a bit. Yep. Is that also set in uh, the Greek world? No. no. So, so that's not. It's what you'd call magical realism. Yep. Which is um, also the the style of uh, of floating life, which was a novel that I published in 2011. Yep. And that one does have a nautical theme, which is that a young man in his midlife crisis, who is being um, separate, uh, whose whose wife is basically leaving him, um, finds a mentor. And the mentor runs a difficult to find model boat shop and dreams that the power of the ocean could be harnessed to serve humanity. And he becomes close to this older man and then various adventures and changes ensue for him. Yep. Ah, sounds so it went, it went from a floating life to on wine dark seas. Yep. <laughs> so kept that um, nautical theme up, but not so much with the third. So the third, the third one has gone to the caves yep. <laughs> for a metaphor. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'll look forward to um, uh, seeing when that comes out. It, um, Great. Interesting to read. Um, well, I guess that kind of wraps things up, but I thought, um, could you just point people in a, if, if people wanted to follow you, um, where could they find you online? Uh, tadcrawford.com. Yep. Yeah, and thank you very much for having me, Mark. I very much enjoyed the chance to to chat with you and discuss the the book and the epic cycle. Yeah, it's been great uh, having you on and just exploring some of those ideas. Um, and interesting for me to read through it as well, just seeing different themes that perhaps I haven't um, encountered before when reading the uh, uh, the Iliad and Odyssey as well. So it's been um, mm. great. And I would great. highly recommend um, everyone jump on, I guess, Amazon or your favorite bookstore. Um, you'd be able to find Online Dark Seas there. Um, or else, alternatively, if audiobooks are your thing, I've been uh, listening to it on Audible. Um, and I found, the, I'm, I was trying to find the name of who read uh, the book for you, but I couldn't find it uh, quickly. But um, his reading of uh, Online Dark Seas is quite good. Um, it brings across a lot of the feeling I, I feel that you were putting into the book itself. Yeah, I was. I was very happy with with the reading that they did, and I think the Kindle version is also available on uh, the Australian Amazon, yep. uh, as well as the Audible version. So, um, one of those two, if people are interested. Yeah. Oh well, um, Tad. Uh, thanks for coming on to talk about Online Dark Seas. Uh, very interesting novel, and. Um, I uh, definitely look forward to seeing what you come out with in the future. Great. Well, thank you for having me, Mark. I very much appreciate it. No problem. I trust you thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with Tad Crawford about his latest masterpiece on Wine Dark Seas. Our discussion delved into the intriguing origins of his narrative, shedding light on Tad's compelling sources of inspiration. His exploration of profound ideas and themes intricately connected to the human psyche left me truly captivated. As I mentioned earlier, I wholeheartedly recommend Tad's work to anyone who has enjoyed the tales of the Homeric epics. His ability to craft a coherent and continuous narrative within this literary tradition is truly commendable. Yet, even if you haven't delved into the poems of Homer, fear not for Tad's skillful incorporation of these timeless ideas and stories from the epic cycle ensures that readers of all backgrounds can easily follow along with his narrative. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting you on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution has truly helped me grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. In our next episode, 
we'll return to our ongoing series where we will journey to the tumultuous third year of the Peloponnesian War. This will encompass the fall of Potidaea, the developing and unfolding siege of Plataea, and the tragic demise of Pericles. I invite you to join me next time for episode 78, Potidaea, Plataea, and Tragedy.